Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Now, a few of you have seen the sermon of my title and are wondering, how biblical are you going to be this morning? <laughs> but trust me, um, uh, uh, we're definitely going to get into the Word and... and uh, you turn to 2 Corinthians, we're going to be chapter 1, starting in verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we, have been, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivers us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You are also joining in helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. Heavenly Father, we just take a moment, Lord, to come before you. Lord, we want a message from you, not a message of man, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you'd just bless my words that the body would be edified and the body would be built up, Lord, through this message, and that many people would be encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the last time I preached, I um, kind of sprung it on pastor that my sermon had developed into a two-part um, sermon. So I got to do two Sundays in a row. And when I was preparing for this one, it developed into more of like a 10-part series. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to get 10 weeks in a row. So um, I had to cut out a few of them to, uh, to uh, signal in on, on one of them. But um, the title, what I titled the sermon is Bad Meme Theology. If you're active at all on social media, or what I wanted to name it was bad Twitter theology, but I didn't know if we get into copyright um, infringement anywhere there or something like that, so I figured I'd better name it something else. But um, you see a lot of crazy stuff on social media and what even things that Christians say to one another that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. They sound good at the beginning, but then when you actually think about it, you're like, that isn't at all what the Bible says. Um, and I could come, I thought about doing a top 10 worst ones, but then again, I couldn't narrow it down, so I just picked one. But has anybody ever seen this one? They kind of flashed it for me before, and I didn't know you guys were probably thinking, what in the world is he talking about, but we'll see if we can get it back up there. I don't know if it's going to work or not. I kind of sprung this on the guys in the last minute. So, um, anyway, what that little blip says <laughs> is God will never give you more than you can bear. How many have heard that before? How many have seen that before? God will never give you more than you can bear or more than you can handle. All right, that's good. You can go back to the... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> When I saw that flash during the worship, I'm like, oh, now everybody's thinking, what in the world is this guy doing? But it's not true. God can give you more than you can handle. And that's exactly what Paul was talking about when he wrote back to the Corinthians. You know, and why does God put us, what we're going to talk about this morning is, you know, God does give us more than we can handle at times. And why is it that God gives us more than we can handle? That's right. That's right. And we get into it. And Paul says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul was talking about at this time. Paul had a lot of stuff going on in his life. Um, you know, when you think about it, I've, when I was reading through the list of all the things, all the afflictions that Paul went through, you know, there was part of me that was like, well, you probably kind of deserved it, you jerk, because of what he, did to, what he did to the church beforehand is Saul. 
You know, I mean, he persecuted the church heavily and was even there present when, when Stephen was martyred. Um, but Paul had a lot of adversaries, you know, and when, when they, the commentaries and the historians, they like to argue back and forth on what it was that Paul was going through. Some say, you know, the, it might have been the riot that he was caught up in Ephesus when he was there. Um, Paul was also really sick. Um, he talks about other things that he had a thorn in his side all the time. Um, even talks about one time the, the wild beasts that he had to contend with. And there's even debate whether those were actual wild beasts or if he was talking about the people that were coming against him. Um, and it could have even very well been the pain of what he felt that was going on in Corinth at the time. Um, a little bit of background on what Corinth, you know, as best we can tell, um, the first letter, the f- first Corinthians is actually the second letter that Paul wrote to, to the church at Corinth. And then there's either another letter or another visit in between Second Corinthians or First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. So Paul went there on his second missionary journey and established the church there. But um, Corinth was a very evil place, and in the ancient world, Corinth was at um, the crossroads of all the trade that was going on from east to west. And they, they had a port nearby, and, and it was a very rich city, but it was um, a very debauched city also. And if you read through the, um, the accounts in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, even the stuff that Paul had to deal with that was going on inside of the church, you know, people um, sleeping with their relatives and, and going to the, the prostitutes of the temple and all kinds of crazy stuff that was going on within the church, you can imagine what was going on in the town. Um, but it's a very evil place. But Paul doesn't tell us um, what exactly he was going through. But that actually makes it a little bit better for us because then we can almost insert ourselves into Paul's situation. Because we have troubles that go on in our life. And we have troubles that overwhelm us. In any case, um, the pressure was so great on Paul that it said he wanted to die in this. In the actual language, in the actual Greek language, when you read it, it meant that it has great pressure, that he was weighed down beyond all measure, that he had so much stress on him. And he felt as though the world was crushing down on him. Has anyone here ever felt like you've had the weight of the world crushing down on you? That you didn't know how you were going to make it through a situation? You ever felt like you were surrounded by wild animals? And that you had adversaries on every side of you? And that's what Paul went through. One thing that I always thought, that I always like to visualize when you talk about being weighed down and being under great pressure is when you make grape juice. Right? Or when you make fruit juice, what do you have to do? You have to crush the fruit to get the juice out of it. And when you crush a grape, you're going to get grape juice. And if you crush a good grape, you're going to get good juice. If you crush a sour grape, you're going to get sour juice out of it, right? So whatever comes out of you when you're under great pressure is what you truly have inside of you. And sometimes that's scary. I know it is for me. You get caught up in a situation and things are happening fast and you react away and afterwards you go back and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Why did I react that way? I can't believe I said the things that I said. Because deep down in our hearts, sometimes there's still that evil that lurks in there. And we, we war against that all the time. But when you're under pressure... That's when you're going to find out what's inside of you. You can never crush a bad grape and get good juice. Then we can be under a lot of pressure. But the good thing is that we know we have a Savior who's also felt that pressure too. You think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When he's praying before he's getting ready to go to the cross. I mean, he literally sweat drops of blood because of the stress that he was under. I don't know if I've ever met anybody who's been under that much stress before. 
I know people are under stress, but I've never seen somebody be so anguished and so tight in prayer that they actually sweat drops of blood. And that's not, it's not a metaphorical, you know, just something, the allegory that they throw in there to be like, oh, this is cute, it's always drop. It's an actual documented medical condition that people, when they get under that much stress, they'll break the capillaries in their forehead and they'll actually sweat drops of blood from that, from that much stress that they're, that they're under. But what did Paul learn when he was in this situation? Paul learned that he couldn't place his trust in himself to get him through it. He had to place his trust in God. And if you think about it, when you get these sayings like, well, God will never give you anything more than you can handle. Well, really what they're saying is, you've got the strength inside of you to get through it. They put everything on you. And that's just the psychology and humanism of the world that sneaks in there to try to tell Christians, like, oh, you can handle it. You can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And look, God, God could put you in a situation where you can't do it on your own. And you have no recourse but other than to cast your cares on him and to come to him and let him deal with it. You know, I've never had... a. You know, I think one of the worst things I could ever go through as a parent is to have a sick kid. I mean, I've never had, I mean, we've had, you know, we, we have frequent flyer miles at the ER, all right? So we got, we, we've had our trips there. But we've never had to deal with, you know, a, a sick kid where you don't know if they're going to survive or not. I mean, I can't imagine that stress. And, and how do you deal with that? You don't have any other recourse than to go to God with it. Because there's nothing you can do. And what does Paul say? We trust in God because he's able to raise the dead. And that he can deliver us from such a great peril as death. I mean, even if you die, death has no sting over you anymore. For a Christian, for a believer... He can raise you from the dead. But ultimately, even if somebody gets in a situation where they die, a martyr gets in a situation where they die, ultimately, if they're a believer, if you're a Christian, you're going to be raised from the dead. So no matter how stressful the situation is, and I know this is one of those things that gets easier to say than it is to go through it, but we have to cast our cares on God and know that even if things go horribly bad, in the end... If we don't lose our faith in him, he'll raise us from the dead. And we'll get to spend the rest of eternity with him. And sometimes God chooses not to deliver people from situations. I mean, I, don't ask me why God does the things that he does. But sometimes he chooses not to. There have been many Christian martyrs that have died terrible deaths. You know, I can't, and I thought, I mentioned Stephen earlier. You know, you take this thing, God will never give you anything more than you can handle. Could you imagine one of the guys saying that to Stephen when he, as he's getting stoned? I mean, you probably get a, at least a dirty look from the guy, right? I mean, Stephen, God's never going to give you anything more than you can handle as you're getting pelted by rocks. I also thought of, you know, John Huss, who was burned at the stake. You gonna tell that guy, is there light in the fires? God's never gonna give you more than you can handle. There are times God does give you more than you can handle. But where do they get that from? People who say that, where do, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. Actually, they take scripture and twist it just a little bit, which is what always makes the great. You know, the people that know the littlest about the Bible are the, the best at twisting it so it sounds good and fits what they want it to, right? In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul said, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. 
but with temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. God never promises you that you're going to escape the situation that you're in. But what he does promise you is that he'll provide a way out of the temptation. Okay, so what does that mean? All right, now you're talking double. All right, if you're being burned alive at the stake, what temptation are you being delivered from? Well, you're being delivered from the temptation to, to deny him. You're being delivered from the temptation to lose your faith. That's the temptation that you can escape. Even in a bad situation, even in a horrible situation, you might have to endure that hardship. But what God promises you is that he'll give you the strength and the ability and leave a way out so that you won't be tempted to sin in that situation. It doesn't mean you're going to get out of it. It doesn't even mean that you'll be able to endure it. But you will be able to not lose your faith in the situation. And what it does when they take that little bit of scripture and twist it is exactly what, you know, more and more I learn, the more and more I see this world, the more and more I see it go back to the Garden of Eden. When Satan tells Eve, did God really say that? Because especially on social media and stuff like this, you know, where it's 144 characters or less. You can't have a Christian thought less than 144 characters, all right? It's, the Bible's deeper than that. Your faith is deeper than that. That it can be just put in these little snippets, right? There's so much more to your faith than that. So they love to throw these things out there. God said this, God will do this, God will do that, right? But that's not, that's not what our faith is. You take, and Satan likes to take that little bit of scripture and twist it just a little bit so that it sounds good on the surface. But it can lead you to death, just like it did Eve. And in the same garden, you know, Adam had a choice. Was he going to honor God and go according, according to God's will? Or was he going to go and do his own thing? And ultimately he chose to go and do his own thing. But later on, the second Adam is in a garden and he's struggling with the choice. Am I going to do my will or am I going to do God's will? And Jesus chose not to do his own will, but to do the will of God. Even though he knew it was going to cost him everything. Did you imagine? I mean, I... Imagine the fact that Christ knows he is going to be separated from the Father when he takes on the sin of the world. And he has never known that for all of eternity. You, Matt, no wonder, <laughs> no wonder Jesus was stressed. No wonder in his flesh he didn't want to go through with that. I mean, I don't think, it wasn't the pain of the cross that Jesus was scared of. He knew that was temporary. But just the simple fact that he was going to be separated from his father for whatever little amount of time to take on sin was something that crushed him. But he said, not your will, not my will, but your will be done. So how do we get this so that we can endure and not deny Christ? Because Paul says we set our hope upon him. We know he's the one that we hope in. He's the one we know is going to ultimately deliver us from this world. If we put our hope in him and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us and being raised from the dead, that no matter what we endure in this life, ultimately we get the victory and we'll be with him. But in, practic in practicality, what does that look like? What does that look like within the church? And Paul talks about that starting in verse 11. We also pray for one another and help one another. What does praying for one another do? Well, we can build each other up. And we can build up the body through prayer. And we can bear one another's burdens. And what does prayer do? It shows that we understand that God has the answers, not us. 
When we bring a situation to God and pray about it, we're taking it out of our hands and putting it in God's hands. And it shows that we're submitting our will to God's will. When we ask for his help and we bring these problems to him, that we're asking him to take control and we're, we're letting go of it. You know, another one of those silly little things, you know, when they say, well, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, and I don't, you don't want to be a backseat driver, but I think one of the best preachers I ever heard, he said, no, if you want to make that real, he said, what you have to do is take the keys, get out of the car, go lock yourself in the trunk, throw the keys out, and say, God, go anywhere you want to go. So you don't even have the chance to reach across. You sit in the back seat, well, then you're tempted to reach up there and grab a hold of the wheel, right? You've got to lock yourself in the trunk. Because then you don't have a chance to. And uh, when I was preparing uh, for this message, you know, and thinking of things that, that uh, people go through and the things that they have to endure, I met a man early on in my military career. His name was Eugene McDaniel. And he was, and I believe still is, listed as one of the most um, tortured U.S. Uh, servicemen um, in the military history. He spent uh, six years in the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam. And uh, he was there still when they, uh, when they were liberated, when they, let, when they let them go, when they let the prisoners go. And um, there's one point towards the end of the war um, when, things were got, when things got really bad and they wanted them to make these propaganda films. And um, I was going to read, <laughs> I was going to read some of what he was, he went through, but I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do it uh, and um, keep my voice straight. Uh, but he went through some horrific torture. And what they wanted him to do was give in and make a tape saying that what he'd done was bad and to give some other prisoners up who had, had escaped and tell the story of how they had escaped. Um, but there's a point, and what, what's interesting, what, what I really like about his story is that when we read the story of the martyrs, we don't always necessarily get to understand what they went through or what they were thinking when they were enduring their hardship. And um, Captain McDaniel, you know, he, was, he wasn't persecuted for his faith so much as he was because, you know, he's a, a service member of war and, and they tortured him. But he was a Christian, so he, he, you can read in his book about his struggles that he had with his faith going through it. And, and he says at one point they had, um, they had tortured him for uh, two weeks solid. And he, he estimates that he had lost between 35 and 40 pounds in those two weeks. Um, I'm going to try to do this. but uh, It says, on the 14th day, I was moved to the carriage house in the zoo. All right, I'm not going to be able to. <laughs> But basically, they did everything they could to take him to the edge of death, and then they wouldn't let him die. They would only treat him with medicine and food when he wasn't going to make it. And so, to them, it was to save faith, to save face that he wouldn't die because of his torture. Um, but he had, through it all, he had lost um, the use of both of his hands because of the ropes. Um, And he, after this, he says, uh, so they took me back again, and I didn't think I could take any more of it. <clears throat> I felt alone now, more than at any other time. I felt forsaken. <clears throat> now I knew what depression was. Depression is so deep, I could not even pray. Could not even think of my family. My mind went into total neutral. 
a kind of withdrawal, and it seemed that nothing could pull me out. <clears throat> and he offers a simple little prayer to God. And he said, in my feeble way again, I said, Lord, it is yours. Whatever this means, whatever it's supposed to accomplish in me, whatever you have in mind, now with all of this, it's all yours. He said, that's all I could say. That was all I had the mental strength to frame. I knew it wasn't much, but I meant it. And so he went through, after that, another two weeks. <clears throat> and he said, during this time, for weeks on end, my faith felt faltered badly. And after about two weeks in the stable, I got very sick. So sick that they had to pour medicine into, my, into me for 15 days to even get me propped up again. And eventually they, they let him go back to, uh, to be, they had him in solitary confinement this whole time. And he was in pretty rough shape. Um, he had, uh, they had broken his arm and they just like pushed the bone back in. And his legs were so swollen from the beatings that they couldn't even put him in leg irons anymore. And he says that, you know, as he said, he's, my faith faltered. And he's like, I felt abandoned. But he lived, and they put him back. They eventually put him back in with the other uh, the other prisoners. And he said, "That's where God taught me what it really meant to be a Christian and what Christian brothers could do, because they prayed with him, they took care of him, they were able to nurse him back to health the best that they could. They had to help him go to the bathroom. He couldn't even he couldn't walk." Um, they would, at one point, they would beat his back and the back of his legs with um, a, f a fan belt that had been knotted. And for, at one point, um, for two days, they worked in two-man rotations. Um, so, but he said that um, one night, when our evening prayer, we said our evening prayers together, and I sat listening to the others, I began to sense the wonder of God's handiwork in me. Since the moment at the very height of my despair and torture, that when the Lord had heard my feeble prayer of surrender, I had seen some beautiful gestures from him through my roommates. Not only was I miraculously spared from death and torture, I had been delivered from isolation and put into the hands of men who cared for me and healed me. I was beginning to know, finally, what the suffering of Christ meant. But I was also beginning to know the benediction of God in my life. So, I mean, I think that I didn't intend to tell, try to tell his story on Veterans Day, but when it kind of fell that way, then I thought that was fitting also. But, and, and I don't read that to try to tug at your heartstrings. I really don't. But to drive home the fact that we can be put in bad situations, and not even necessarily because of our faith. You know, the church likes to talk a lot about, oh, you're, you know, you're going to get tested for, you know, because of your, your stand for Christ, and which is true. And I don't want to diminish that, but sometimes you can find yourself in a situation that isn't because it was something that was instigated because of your faith. If you, if you get what I'm saying, I mean, you, you, can, you can be, you can have problems at work. You can be put in bad financial uh, places that aren't because of your faith, but your faith is what's going to take you through it. And when you get low and you despair, Paul did that too. It's like, you know, you're not a bad Christian because you struggle. But you want to have just like he did and like Paul does, you cast your cares upon Christ. You put your hope in him, and that's what's going to get, get you through it. And why does Paul say in the end that many thanks will be given? And one thing that Paul learned to do Paul learned to be a blessing to others despite his suffering. 
in, in our, our weekly Bible study this last week, we talked about it too, and that, you know, when we get mistreated, a lot of times our gut reaction is we want to feel sorry for ourselves. If we, somebody treats us badly, or we get in a bad situation, we want to think, oh, well, and we get, we get to look at ourselves instead of looking around to see who we can help who's in that same situation. And I heard a story about a young lady who was on her way to church and um, she got into a car accident. And it wasn't her fault and another lady had hit her. And so she was, she was in her car and she felt that, you know, God told her, you need to go pray for that lady. And so she went over to the car and, and she said, you know, ma'am, um, is there anything that I can pray with you about? And the lady just started bawling. And she unloads all this stuff that she'd been going through in her life. And, and that's why she, and she was on, I believe she was on the way to the hospital to see her husband or something like that. And that's why she was distracted and why she, she got into the car accident. And so the young lady was able to, to pray with her. But it's a simple illustration of a time when something isn't your fault. And you're going to find yourself in a bad situation. But instead of getting sucked in on yourself and what's going to happen with you, you want to take that time to look around and to see if there's somebody else that you can help through too. The second Corinthians, and Paul goes on to say in uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 14, it says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about the body, the dying of, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believed, therefore we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. So it is very real that we can find ourselves in situations that we can't bear. Not that situations that may seem like they're too much, but truly are too much for us to bear in our own power. So we need to have two responses when we endure hardship. This is always... The key thing when I preach, you know, I love listening to, to preachers preach, and I'm, there's one thing I'm always listening for, and it's always one of the hardest things for preachers to do is get to that so what moment, is what, what I, I like to call the so what moment. You know, we can, you can listen, great, great. You always think of this in like my history classes, when I like my, take my church history classes, great things that God did, and there's amazing things in the Bible but then you get to that, well, so what? So what am I, what am I supposed to do with this then? You know? and, and the stories do build our faith. I mean, they're amazing. I mean, you can expound for hours on what it means to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. You know? I mean, and that builds your faith. But at the end of it, you're like, that's really awesome. But what do, what do I do with it? You know? So it's always that so what moment. So what are we supposed to do with what Paul went through? I think it's because we have to have two responses when we endure hardship. For one, when we endure, and foremost is it's used to draw us closer to God in His strength. And there's many stories in the Old Testament, and I think of like Gideon, you know, when he cuts his numbers down, and what does God tell him? I don't want, I'm doing this so you don't think you did it on your own power. I'm putting you in this situation so you know that I'm the one that delivered you. Think of Jonathan and his armor bearer when they, when they went up the hillside to, to attack the enemy. You can't do that on your own power. Two men don't battle uphill to try to take a fortified position. That doesn't happen. 
Okay, you can't do that. I don't care how great of a soldier you are, you can't do that. God can put you in a situation where you have no response other than to say, it was him that got me through that. It was him that delivered me in that situation. And I think the second response we have to our hardships is very much so that we can speak and that we can bless others for what we learned and what we endured in that situation. I've heard many, many preachers who, you know, grew up as terrible sinners in their childhood and got into terrible things. But they were able to use that later on so that they could talk to people who were in those same situations and be like, you know, this is, this is how I got through it. God delivered me through it. So you can give hope to other people that are in that same situation. And I always say, you know, Job didn't have the book of Job to read when he was going through his trial, right? And even when he asked God, why, why did you do this? What was God's response to him? Don't question me. You don't question how I do things. And God never gave him an answer. But yet, God still supplied everything back to Job. But he still, for the rest of his life, dealt with that pain of the loss of his children. He had more children, but there was still pain that he suffered from that and still that he carried from that. So sometimes we can endure hardships just so later on it could be an encouragement to somebody else. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that your word can give us encouragement, Lord, and get us through the rough times in our lives. Lord, I pray that when we get into bad situations that we don't try and solve those problems on our own. We find ourselves in those bad situations that we would cast all of our cares and all of our strength upon you to get us through them, Lord. And that we would be drawn closer to you. And that you would build our faith and strengthen us in our beliefs and our hope and our trust in you, Lord Jesus. And I pray as we go from here, Lord, that these seeds would take root and that we would be changed people, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.